Gold reserves of 21,000 tons, which makes up 41% of their reserves. The emerging countries have 4,000 tons, which is 4% of their reserves. That 41% is going to flow to the right progressively in the next few years. And the more mistakes that the Western countries make, the faster that flow will go. <coughs> and in, in essence, central bank underlying support for the purchase of gold is one of the strongest factors. The red line here is the debt to GDP ratio in the US. The blue line is the US personal savings rate. You can see how crazy the period of 1982 to 2009 was. The debt to GDP ratio is rolled over. That basically signals the end of 30 years of debt financed consumption that is not going to be coming back anytime soon. The long term trend of the stock market, contrary to popular belief, what we experienced from 1982 to 1999 is the anomaly. Most of the last 112 years, the markets have gone in cycles that essentially went sideways. The current period started back in March of 2000. <coughs> we had a top in 2007, and in my view, we're in the third top of the decade of that period at this point. We're being led down this time uh, by the euro markets. The, the line on top here is the three tops on the S&P. The lower one is the euro blue chip index. And if you get into some of those European countries, uh, Spain and Italy are already threatening their 2009 lows. So as a technician, this cycle, we're into a new bearish cycle within the bearish secular trend, in my view. The most frightening picture on the S&P 500, the blue line here is the S&P with those last two tops. The red line is the increase in government debt. And you can see that they basically, they cleaned the stock market clock, bailed out the banks, and government debt took off at a frightening pace. Consumer debt peaked, and more recently, they're suggesting that there's some excitement about consumer debt picking up. But when you look at the breakdown of that consumer debt, it's not flowing down to Joe's six-pack on Main Street. The bulk of that increase is coming from student loans, which basically reflects the long-term unemployed and uh, the unemployable and those that would like a better job, basically resorting to financing their standard of living by student loans. Then when the Congress talks about forgiving student loans, that's just another trillion. But you know, what's a trillion dollars these days? <coughs> Red line here is mortgage debt, the blue line is the Case-Shiller Home Index. Home prices are now back to 2002 levels. The difference is that there's $3.8 trillion more mortgage debt outstanding at this point. That 3.8 trillion is on the books somewhere in a banking system that's become progressively more opaque and scares the daylights out of me. The last budget ceiling or debt ceiling increase was an absolute farce. They projected it to run through the election so they wouldn't have to deal with it again. Their estimates were so bad that they're now going to hit the debt ceiling in August. Just before, just before Labor Day is when it's likely to hit. But you can rest assured that, Bern that uh, Geithner will find a way to fudge around it. I've been working on the basis that the top of May 2011 was the cyclical peak. I'm wrong in the sense that the, uh, the most recent funding made higher highs, but not universally. And an average median cyclical bear cycle still will take the Dow down to something between 8,500 and 81 or 8,200, and I would say that's average. I would argue that the circumstances today suggest we may have a greater than average bear market decline. <coughs> this red line basically highlights cumulative net upside volume minus downside volume. In the past week, it has broken down, which is why I'm saying as strongly as I can that we have completed the top and if you didn't like the summer of 2010 or the summer of 2011, I think the summer of 2012 has even more downside for the stock market. The Facebook IPO, this I think says it all. Uh, I, if, boy, if there was ever a kid that should not be running a public company, this is the kid. <coughs> the Euro, who can imagine that the Euro is being discussed as a currency that may go away? I originally suggested the most appropriate name would be the Frankenstein. 
There's the long-term trend of the dollar against the euro. You got a big base forming on the right, and here's a close-up of that base. <coughs> There's an awful lot of people that are saying that the dollar is going to go up, but that dollar index, as bad as it is, really is having a hard time getting much through 80. The real crisis, I think, comes if it can get through 90. If it gets to 90, that basically tells you there's a much larger financial problem unfolding, and I think that could be a serious problem for the global banking system. Yeah, I see that uh, Jamie Dimon uh, had a, a comeuppance last Thursday night, and by Friday afternoon they had him walking on water again. I didn't realize that the Hudson River had frozen overnight. <laughs> But I think Dennis Garvin and others have said that, you know, killing one cockroach doesn't do much. <laughs> Here's the, the blue line here is the U.S. dollar index. The red line is the dollar declining against gold. And what this really says is the U.S. dollar is emerging as the best looking horse in the glue factory. <laughs> That's all it is. Basically, I still will stick with the gold price. This gold trend since the year 2000 has been remarkably orderly. This is an overlay with the trend that we had from 1971 to 1980. You see how sharp those run-ups were to 1974 and to 1980. <coughs> we haven't seen anything like that yet. I think we will. The, big, the blue circle was a major currency crisis of October 1978. That really set the stage for the final run-up to the 850 top. And when the Greek tragedy started unfolding, I thought that was the moment that we were entering into that uh, two years ago, right on schedule with the previous cycle. But I didn't realize that the, Greece, the, Greek, uh, the Greek authors were gonna successfully turn it into a quarterly serial. And uh, before it's done, you know, the, the crisis unfolding in Europe, I believe, will cast a huge flow of capital from Euro into dollars and into gold, and the proportional run in gold will even have gold rising against a strong dollar, which will really confuse the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> this is a long-term chart of gold mining shares relative to the metal. <coughs> the, gold, the red line is the shares to metal performance. Period A from 1967 to 1980, the gold miners could never keep up with the gold price, and then they finally made their peak nine months after the gold price. B, from 1982 to 1996, was a period of tremendous growth in the gold mining industry, and it culminated with the Briex fiasco and a huge collapse that bottomed in 2000, 2001. The, the stocks came back to peak in December of 03, and basically the gold mining shares, once again, have been unable to keep up with the gold price. And the only thing I can say that's encouraging about this chart is we're almost down to the point where the major gold mining stocks become a very attractive buy one more time. There's a history of that gold mines index. Basically it's a link or a splice of the current GDM index that underlies the GDX ETF with the old Toronto Gold Mines Index going way back. You see very few spikes below that central blue trend line, but we're into one now. The only missing link in my mind is I want to see how the gold shares behave when the margin clerks respond to a thousand point down day in the Dow. Nobody wants to see a thousand point down day in the, on the Dow, but if you would like to buy gold stocks, that is the day you want to take your tums, change the diapers, and buy them. Because this market is overdue for a diaper change moment, in my view. Here's the reason why I finally found a good cartoon of the helicopter man. This shows the moves we've had since 2003. The red lines, the gold shares, outperforming the, the gold price on a rally. <coughs> a and B is what everybody was expecting, and we haven't had one since 2006, 2000, and 2008. C to D is what I'm afraid of. If we get a big liquidation in the stock market, and right now I think that could be looming, and I think the gold shares will get a very good opportunity, and I think we will start to see the gold shares respond pretty well. I really want to buy the junior gold mining shares. <coughs> 
is when the stock market is taking it on the chops. We've had some encouraging, I would say, liquidation of the longs and the commitment of traders' reports. And basically, the only link is we need a sell-off in the S&P. And at that stage, there is going to be a marvelous buying opportunity for gold stocks. We finally got the 50-day moving average below the 200-day for the so-called death cross. To me, it's tremendously bullish. What people don't realize is in a strong secular uptrend, the last three of the four times that we had a 50-day cross below the 200-day came after the low in the gold price. So in my view, we're very, very close to a really exciting bottom. And for those that remember the diamond top in May of 1996 at the New York Gold Show when everybody was swinging from the chandeliers and it was the secular top, we're almost at the opposite extreme now. And I'm hearing so many people saying that the gold cycle is over, that I'm really starting to get quite bullish. I just want to see one diaper change moment in the S&P and then back up the truck because I believe the secular uptrend is going to continue. <coughs> I always close with this slide, and I would remind you, it's bad buying that causes most losses, and the opportunities in market rarely happen when they're convenient. So with that, I'm not sure that I understand the clock because it changed on me a moment or two ago. I think my time is up. So with that, I'm going to thank you all, and I hope some of you can come tonight at 6.25, I'll be doing a 45-minute session that goes through these and a lot more other charts in greater detail. So thank you all very much for your attention. Alexco Resources trades on the Toronto